Good evening. I'm uh, Robert Silvers, editor of the New York Review of Books. I'm I'm very glad to welcome you to this uh, symposium on the economic crisis. It's jointly sponsored uh, by the Penn World Voices and the New York Review. Now, most of our distinguished symposiasts have written very widely, sometimes in the New York Review, and I'm going to very quickly introduce them alphabetically. Now, first, Bill Bradley. He served as U.S. Senator from New Jersey, 1979 to 1997. 2000, he ran in the presidential primaries against Al Gore. He's now managing director of the Merchant Bank, <coughs> Allen and Company. He's written five books, the most recent being The New American Story. It's a call for increased citizen involvement in the political process. Uh, next, Neil Ferguson. He's currently Lawrence Tisch Professor of History at Harvard. He's, well, he's also William Ziegler Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School. Since 1995, <clears throat> he's published 10 books on political and economic history, a famous book on the history of the Rothschild Bank, among other things. His latest book is The Ascent of Money, history of the evolution of credit, stock market, insurance around the world. Then we have Paul Krugman. We all know his column in the New York Times. He's also a professor of economics and international affairs at Princeton, a centenary professor at the London School of Economics. He's written widely known books uh, on economics and, and a uh, a standard work on international economics, the theory and policy. He did that with Morris Obsfield. Now, his most recent book is The Return of Depression Economics and the Crisis of 2008. Last year, he won the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics. Now, our moderator uh, is Jeff Madrick. He's a frequent contributor to the New York Review. He's editor of Challenge Magazine. He's visiting professor at Cooper Union. He's senior fellow at the Schwartz Center for Economic Policy at the New School. His most recent book is The Case for Big Government. It was published last October. He's writing a history of the US economy since 1970. Then we have Nouriel Roubini. Distinguished Professor of Economics at NYU's Stern School of Business, prominent commentator on the economic crisis since he first began predicting it would happen in 2004. <laughs> A former advisor of the US Treasury Department, former member of the White House Council of Economic Advisors. He now has his own consultancy firm uh, RGE Monitor, which runs what has been described by The Economist as the number one economics website in the world. Now, he's often called in the press Dr. Doom. He, is, he has said no, he's Dr. Realist. Then we have uh, George Soros, he's chairman of both the Soros Fund and the Open Society Institute, which is one of the world's most active and imaginative organizations for promoting human rights. He first appeared in the New York Review in 1974, and investment and philosophy have long been combined in his work, as in his most recent book, The New Paradigm for Financial Markets, The Credit Crisis of 2008, and What It Means. John Cassidy, reviewing that book, suggested it would be foolhardy to bet against him, a prediction that's been proven true, as he both forecast much of what's happened since and made more than a billion dollars in the last year. <laughs> finally, finally, Robin Wells, researcher in economics, at Princeton, she's taught economics at the University of Michigan, at Stanford University, at MIT. 
She's the co-author with Paul Krugman of Economics. She's published widely in academic journals as well as in the New York Review. So thanks to you all for participating. And now, over to you, Jeff Madrick. Thank you. <clears throat> Th thank you all for coming. We have uh, a, an awesome task here. We have six highly distinguished panelists and something less than 90 minutes to solve the world's problems. Six months ago, it was six months ago now that the Lehman debacle occurred, that AIG was rescued, that Bank of America bought Merrill Lynch. <clears throat> About six months ago that the TARP funds started being distributed. Only on Monday are we going to find out what's really on the bank balance sheets. This frightens me. We've been operating, it seems to me, with so little information. The, uh, the so-called stress tests will be out. I think it says something about the way government has managed this economy. The economy was doing fairly poorly in much of 2008 and then fell off a cliff in the last quarter of 2008 and into 2009, growing, falling at a 6% annual rate, an extraordinary drop in our national income. It is now, by some very important measures, the worst economic recession in post-World War II, the post-World War II era. Employment has dropped faster than ever before in this space of time. Industrial production, and by many other criteria, it's almost the worst. And it isn't over yet. The one last thing I want to say, what gives us all the jitters is that this is a three-front problem. A housing market that went crazy and the bubble burst. A credit crisis, the most severe we've known since the early 1930s. And now a sharp drop in demand for goods and services and capital investment leading to a severe recession. What gives us the jitters is that all of these are related and can make all those other factors worse. I'm not going to talk anymore because we want to hear what our panelists have to say. My job is to try to keep us to time. I've asked each of them to comment in the first six or seven minutes in their introductory remarks on what the current state of the economy is. Many people are saying they're green shoots. We have seen some deceleration in the decline of the economy. Green shoots are showing. What is the actual state of the economy? And do we need a serious mid-course correction on the part of the government? Do we have to change policy and what we should do? All of that in six or seven minutes for each of us. Let's go immediately to Senator Bradley. And again, I will try and keep us on time. Senator. Uh, thanks very much, Jeff. It's an honor for me to be on this panel. I look around at distinguished uh, historians and economists and financiers and wonder what I'm doing here. Uh, but I assume that um, I'm here because I think that any solution to the problem, certainly even defining the problem that we're facing, has to be able to be defined so the average guy understands. And the solution to the problem has to be given so that the slightly above average guy understands. So uh, how are we along the recovery? I mean, when Citicorp drops from 60 to 1 and then comes back to 3, I don't think that's a recovery. When Warren Buffett buys GE and uh, Goldman Sachs, and after he buys it, it drops 45 to 50%, and that if he's going to even break even, he's got to earn 9% for the next 12 years, I don't think that's a recovery. Um, if you look at uh, what we should do about this, um, on the one hand, the administration has put in place uh, measures that, if they were to work, could offer some hope. What I'd like to suggest is if they don't work, there's an alternative. And I'd like to put it uh, this way. You know, we have um, essentially spent uh, about $12.7 trillion in commitments and actually spent a little over $4 trillion in this crisis. Some institutions, such as Citicorp, for example, uh, received about $60 billion in direct assistance and $340 billion in guarantees. So the U.S. taxpayer is into Citicorp for about $400 billion. So I look at this and I say, if we look out 
to June, July, and the PPI program is not succeeding. The assets aren't being bought at levels that they should be bought from the banks or from the books of banks. That there is an alternative because in the interim between now and then there will have been a stress test. Few banks will be identified. Who knows? It might even be postponed. Uh, and also, Secretary Geithner will have the authority to come in and deal effectively and forcefully with non-bank financial institutions. So when I look out to July, August, PPIP isn't working. The stress tests have been delayed. There was an argument about how, whether the government is right or the banks are right, but clearly there are a few that are in very serious problems. And you have uh, the secretary with that new authority. Uh, you think back to Citicorp. We put $400 billion into it. I looked at the ticker today. The market cap of Citicorp is $17 billion. So the government could buy Citicorp for a fraction of what we've already obligated the taxpayer for. And in buying Citicorp, as an example, could be a other one or two others, it would, the government would announce in four to six months we were going to sell these assets, the good assets, back to the public who wouldn't pay for the largest depositor base in the world. And if you bought Citicorp for, let's say, $20 billion, what would it be worth if you sold the good bank back to the public? And I mean the public. I don't mean selling it to hedge funds, although they can participate. But I would do it as a rights offering to any American who wants to invest in this good bank. I think the very prospect of that happening would be, bring very strong positive influence on the development of the whole economy. And what would the government be, then be left with? The government would then be left with the bad bank. It would be left with the assets that we're going through loops now to try to get off of the bank books, and instead the government would have them and could take 20, 15 to 20 years to, uh, to clean them up. So when I, I look at this, I say I'd like to see the existing program work. If it doesn't work, there is an alternative. And it's an alternative that in the long run, the average guy in America could participate in. Thank you, Senator. Just six minutes. Very impressive. <laughs> Professor Ferguson. Well, Jeff, panelists, ladies and gentlemen, we are living through historic times. This is the end of the age of leverage, which began, I guess, in the late 1970s and saw an explosive rise uh, in the ratio of debt to gross domestic product not only in this country, but in many, many other countries. Uh, once you end up with debts, public, public and private debts, uh, in excess of three and a half times the size of your annual output, you are Argentina. <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny that, that people refer all the time back to the Lehman crisis. L let's remember that this crisis actually began in June 2007. It fully became clear in August of 2007 that major financial institutions were almost certainly on the brink of insolvency to anybody who bothered to think about the impact of subprime defaults on their balance sheets. But we were in denial for an extraordinarily long time. People, both highly sophisticated and lay people, refused to believe what was happening which is why I called it the Great Repression. <laughs> and we stayed in denial until September, more than a year later of last year. Then we had the breakdown. You'll notice how psychological terms are very helpful when economics fails as a discipline, as it clearly has. So we retreated into the realm of psychology and after the repression, the breakdown, we came out of denial and we realized that probably more than one major bank was insolvent. In September and October, the world went into shock. It was deeply traumatic. Now we're in the therapy phase. <laughs> and what therapy are we using? Well, it's very interesting because we're using two quite contradictory courses of therapy. One 
uh, is the prescription of Dr. Friedman, Milton Friedman, that is. And that's the therapy that's being administered by the Federal Reserve. Massive injections of liquidity to avert the kind of banking crisis that caused the Great Depression of the early 1930s. I'm fine with that. That's the right thing to do. But there's another course of therapy that is simultaneously being administered, which is the therapy prescribed by Dr. Keynes, John Maynard Keynes. And that therapy involves the running of massive fiscal deficits in excess of 12% of gross domestic product this year, and the issuance, therefore, of vast quantities of freshly minted bonds. Now, you know, there's some medicine in your drugs cabinet at home that has passed its sell-by date. And I rather fear, at the risk of provoking the man sitting on the other side of me, <laughs> that it says 1936 on the bottle of Dr. Keynes's medicine. Why do I think this? Because there's a clear contradiction between these two policies, and we're trying to have it both ways. You can't be a monetarist and a Keynesian simultaneously. At least, I can't see how you can. Because if the aim of the monetarist policy is to keep interest rates down, to keep liquidity high, the effect of the Keynesian policy must be to drive interest rates up. After all, $1.75 trillion is an awful lot of freshly minted treasuries to land on the bond market at a time of recession. And I still don't quite know who's going to buy all this stuff. It's certainly not going to be the Chinese. That worked fine in the good times. But what I call Chimerica, the marriage between China and America, is sort of coming to a, an end. Maybe it's going to end in a messy divorce. No, the problem is that only the Fed can buy these freshly minted treasuries. And there is going to be, I predict, in the weeks and months ahead, a very painful tug of war between our monetary policy and our fiscal policy. As the markets realize just what a vast quantity of bonds are going to have to be absorbed by the financial system this year. That will tend to drive the price of the bonds down, that will tend to drive up the interest rates, and that will have an effect also on mortgage rates, the precise opposite of what Ben Bernanke is trying to achieve at the Fed. One final thought, I don't want to make a speech, I'd rather engage in, in a conversation. One final thought, let's not think of this as a purely American phenomenon. Let's not be parochial, if we possibly can be. This is a crisis of the global economy. I'd go so far as to say it's a crisis of globalization itself. The US economy is not going to contract the most this year, even if the worst projections of the IMF turn out to be right. 2.6% contraction is far, far less than the shock already being inflicted on Japan, uh, on South Korea, on Taiwan, to say nothing of the shock being inflicted on Europe. The German economy is contracting at somewhere close to 5 or 6%. So we are faced not just with a problem to be dealt with by American policy. We are faced with a crisis of global proportions. And it's far from clear to me that the prescriptions of Dr. Friedman and Dr. Keynes together can solve that massive global crisis. Thank you, Neil. So I think there will be some disagreement on this panel. <laughs> Professor Krugman. Well, um, yeah, I think I, I should respond to that a bit. Let, let, me, let me say, um, uh, actually, I, I wish that we actually still um, if people had remembered that 1936 medication a little bit better. But one of the problems we face in all of this is what I have referred to as, as the great forgetting. Uh, we learned a great deal about how economies can be in crisis during the 1930s. We took a number of prophylactic measures to prevent anything like that from happening ever again. And a very large part of how we got into this crisis is that we forgot all of that. We forgot what our grandfathers knew, that we, we forgot that banking systems need to be very carefully regulated and watched over because uh, banking crises can do terrible damage. Uh, we forgot that financial markets are not, in fact, calm, rational places, uh, that they, they really need to be circumscribed. And so we got into this. And one of the really disappointing things I found as the crisis came upon us, is it also turns out that we've forgotten a lot of the sort of basic 
macroeconomics of this kind of problem, what, what I actually called you know, depression economics in, in, in the book that in a much revised uh, version I, I was reissued last year. Um, and I think it's actually, it, it goes directly to Neil's point here because let's think about, put, put, uh, think about what is actually happening to the global economy right now. What's happening is on the one side, um, there has been an abrupt realization by many people that they have too much debt, that they are over indebted, that they are not as rich as they thought. Uh, U.S. households have seen their net worth decline abruptly by $13 trillion, and there are similar blows occurring around the world. Um, so that people, individual households, want to save again. So the United States has gone from approximately a zero savings rate two years ago up to about 4% right now, which is still below historical norms, but suddenly saving is occurring. Um, that saving ought to be translated into investment, but the investment demand is not there. Um, housing, flat on its back because it was overbuilt. Housing bubbles not only in the United States, but across much of Europe collapsed. Um, many businesses cannot get access to capital because of the breakdown of the financial system. But even those that do have access to capital don't want to invest because, uh, you know, because demand, the consumer demand is not there. Between the housing bust and the sudden decision of consumers that maybe they actually ought to save, after all, um, we're, we have a world that, with lots of excess capacity. And so if you, the, this GDP report that just came out says that business fixed investment uh, non-residential fixed investment, essentially business investment, is falling at a 40% annual rate. So investment is falling through ground. Um, and this causes a problem. Lots of people want to save. Vast increase in the desired savings, not only in the United States but around the world, combined with a sharp decline in the amount that the private sector is willing to invest, even at a zero interest rate, or rather even at a zero interest rate of. Um, for U.S. government debt, which is what the Federal Reserve has the most direct impact on. And one way to think about what we have right now is a global crisis caused by a vast excess of desired savings over willing investment. We have a global savings glut. There is just not enough, you know, another way to say it is we have a global shortage of demand. Those are equivalent ways of, of saying the same thing. So we have this global savings glut, which is why there is in fact no upward pressure on interest rates. There is more savings than we know what to do with. If we ask the question, where will the savings come from to finance these large U.S. government deficits, the answer is from ourselves. At the margin, the Chinese are not contributing at all. So those extra savings are, in effect, the savings that Americans wanted to do anyway, but that U.S. business is not willing to invest under current conditions. That is actually why Keynesian policy works in the short run. It takes excess desired savings and translates them into some kind of spending. If the private sector won't do it, the government will. There is actually no contradiction between the Federal Reserve's actions uh, and the actions of the U.S. government with a fiscal stimulus. Uh, it's very much necessary to do both. The Federal Reserve is essentially going out there and playing the role that the private banking system is no longer playing properly by buying a lot of private securities. The federal government is going out there and borrowing and playing the role that businesses are not, play, are not willing to play by, uh, by engaging in investment. All that debt-financed infrastructure spending is basically filling the hole left by the collapse in uh, business investment in the United States. It's not a, there is not an excess uh, demand for savings uh, that is going to drive up interest rates. The only thing that might drive up interest rates, and this is a real concern, is that people may grow dubious about the financial solvency of governments. So there are real problems. The United States is not there yet. I think we have probably a substantial ways to run, but other countries less so. Ireland is being forced to uh, raise taxes and cut spending because of fears about its solvency, despite a deep recession. The UK is fairly close to the edge because people are worried about the cost of financial bailout. But, but for the United States, that is certainly not an issue. Now, the... The great concern I have is that although we understand these things fairly well, or at least some of us do, um, the uh, and I'm actually referring to Neil. I'm actually referring to uh, I'm actually referring to the uh, to the 38 Republican senators who said that the answer for this is another round of Bush-style tax cuts uh, to cost three trillion dollars over the next decade. Um, but the, uh, the 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 great problem we face is that 
the scale of the crisis has overwhelmed the response. That this is not a qualitative leap. This is not a crisis that we didn't know could happen. Uh, there was a lot of thought at uh, the Federal Reserve, in the academic profession. There was actually a little nest of people at Princeton in the early years of this decade worrying about it. It was me, it was Lars Svensson, who's now at the Riksbank, and there was a guy named Bernanke, Ben Bernanke. Don't know what happened to him. Um, we're worried about something very much like this, but what we all had in mind was a much smaller version of it. And we thought that the Federal Reserve, by being vigorous and uh, a reasonable fiscal stimulus would head off this kind of crisis at the pass. And what's actually happened is this crisis has been so large, the political process has been sufficiently sluggish, the difficulties have been greater than expected, that we are actually deep in this. And yes, there are some green shoots, things are getting worse more slowly, but we have not managed to head off a crisis that could turn out to be self-reinforcing and leave us in this trap for many, many years. Thank you, Paul. Professor Rabini, you're up. Uh, well, it's pretty clear by right now that this is the worst uh, financial crisis and economic crisis and recession since the Great Depression. You know, a number of us were worrying about it a while ago. <clears throat> At this point, it's becoming conventional wisdom. For example, last year, there was this myth of decoupling that even if the US would contract the rest of the world would happily decouple from this U.S. economic contraction. And usually people say when the U.S. Uh, sneezes, the rest of the world catches the cold. This time around, the U.S. was not just sneezing at a severe case of chronic pneumonia and first the financial contagion, and now the real contagion has led to an economic contraction from the U.S. to the Eurozone, the U.K., Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Japan, two-thirds of global GDP advanced economies contracting, and now a hard landing also in emerging markets with severe recession in many of them, slowdown of growth in places like China and risk of outright financial crisis, currency banking, sovereign in a number of emerging market economies. So where are we now and what needs to be done? Uh, you know, people are talking about these green shoots of spring, about second derivatives of economic activity becoming positive, meaning the rate of contraction is not accelerating, but just decelerating, and therefore we're gonna reach a bottom sooner rather than later, glimmers of hope. Uh, but if you look at the data in some sense, and you look at the debate about the shape of this recession, uh, we are in a severe recession right now in the US. A year ago, the consensus was arguing this recession will be short and shallow, V-shaped, lasting maybe eight months like the last two in 1991 and 2001. And people like myself and others were suggesting that given the imbalances in the financial system, the overborrowing and overleveraged by households and even corporates, this will be more like a U-shaped recession, uh, 24 months or so. And I would argue that, I was arguing there will even a risk of a, something more severe, an L-shaped recession or deep depression like the one that Japan experienced after the collapse of its uh, real estate and equity bubble uh, in the 1990s. I would say that right now it's obvious that the V is out of the window. We're already in the 17 months of a severe recession. It's already twice as long as the previous two. If this recession was over, even by the end of this year, it would be 24 months, meaning three times as long and more like six times as deep as any pre previous one uh, in terms of output collapse. And if you look at employment and industrial production and other things, even worse than that, looks like a, almost like a near depression. So the V is out of the window. I would say that the good news is probably that the very aggressive actions by the policymaker in the US and around the world, I think that six months ago there was a risk of a near depression and the policymaker finally got religion, looked into the abyss, the economy was contracting 6% plus US around the world and now they decided to use almost all the weapons in their arsenals, guns, bazookas, missiles, artillery, you name it, monetary, fiscal, credit, 20 different programs. Because of that, I think that the risk of a near depression has been somewhat reduced. I don't think that uh, there is zero probability, but we probably are not gonna end up in a near depression. We learned some of the lessons, as Paul said, from the Great Depression, even from Japan. However, now the consensus is becoming optimistic again and says that we're gonna go from minus 6% growth to positive growth in the second half of the year, meaning the recession is gonna be over in, in June. By Q4, they estimate that growth is gonna be positive 2%, and next year, 
more than 2%, so back to potential. Now, compared to these new consensus that got it wrong in the past, my views are much more bearish. I would agree that the rate of economic contraction is slowing down. If we had the keep on having the free fall of the last two quarters, we'll end up in another Great Depression. And the policy action reducing that, but we're still contracting at a pretty fast rate. I see the economy contracting all the way to the end of the year, so reaching from minus 6, minus 2, not to plus 2. And next year, the growth rate of the economy is going to be so low, 0.5% as opposed to 2% plus of the consensus. And the unemployment rate already this year is going to be above 10% and more likely close to 11% next year. That even next year is going to feel like a recession, even if we are technically out of the recession. And the outlook for Europe and Japan, both year, this year and next year, is even worse. So most advanced economies are going to do even worse than the United States for a number of reasons, structural factors in Japan, weak policy response in the case of the Eurozone. Now, the financial problem, the financial system, my view, are still severe. Many banks are still insolvent. I agree. If you don't want to end up like Japan with zombie banks, uh, as Bill Bradley suggested, it's better to do what Sweden did, take over the banks, clean them up, separate good and bad assets, and sell them back in short order to the private sector. Now, on the question of the policy response, there was a bit uh, of a debate between uh, Neil and, and Paul. And I think that uh, while I'm closer to the views of, of Paul, I think there is some grain of truth about what Neil says in the following sense. There is no inconsistency between monetary easing and fiscal easing. Both of them should be stimulating demand, and the monetary easing should be leading also to restoration of credit. Of course, in a situation which the problems of the economy are problems of not just illiquidity, but also of solvency, traditional monetary policy doesn't work. You also have to do unconventional stuff, and you have to fix the banks. And we need the fiscal stimulus because every component of aggregate demand is collapsing. Consumption, residential investment, capex spending, non-residential construction, inventories, exports. The only thing that can go up and sustain the economy for the time being is fiscal policy. However, there are caveats. The caveat is monetary policy cannot resolve problems of credit, first of all. Secondly, fiscal policy is not without cost. We need in the short run, we're going to add about $9 trillion to U.S. public debt. If you think about the problem of the economy, Neil said it's the end of an age of leverage. It's not really. There is no deleveraging. We have all the liabilities of the households, of the banks, of the corporates, and now we decided to socialize these losses and to put them on the back of the balance sheet of the government. That's why the public debt is rising. When you have a debt problem, you have to convert it into equity. That's what you do with corporate restructure. You convert some unsecured debt into equity. That's what you should do with the banks. Take the unsecured creditors and convert their claims into equity. The same thing you could do with the households, reduce their mortgages and have an upside for the credit in terms of a warrant. What we're doing is not the debt into equity conversion. What we're doing is piling more debt on top of more debt. And at some point, the back of the sovereign is going to break. And when that's going to happen, it's going to be a disaster. So we need fiscal stimulus short run, but we have to worry about the long run too. Thank you, Nereo. There will be time to. Uh, <clears throat> there will be uh, plenty of time to flesh some of this out, Mr. Soros. Well, I think it's fairly obvious by now that we are in a difficult situation. <laughs> uh, there are two features that I think deserve uh, to be pointed out. One is that the financial system, as we know it, actually collapsed. Uh, after the uh, bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers on September 15, the, the financial system really ceased to function and had to be put on artificial life support. And at the same time, the financial shock had a tremendous effect on the real economy. And the real economy went into a free fall uh, and that was global, and international trade was the one that was actually uh, uh, collapsed even more than economic activity. It was the worst hit. The other feature is that the system collapsed of its own weight. Uh, and that contradicted the prevailing view the governing view about financial markets, namely that they tend towards equilibrium and that equilibrium is disturbed 
by uh, extraneous forces, outside shocks, uh, and, and uh, you have then uh, uh, divergences from that equilibrium, but they occur in a random fashion. Uh, but basically, markets are self-correcting. And that paradigm has been proven to be false. Uh, so uh, we, we are dealing not only with the collapse of a financial system, but also with the collapse of a worldview. Uh, and a collapse like this, uh, generally, events always outpace people's ability to understand what's happening. So the response is always lagging behind the problem. And policies that could have worked at one point uh, no longer uh, work at, 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 at the next. So that's the situation that uh, uh, President Obama uh, um, inherited. Um, now, in these circumstances, he is faced with a double objective, two objectives. One, you have to arrest the collapse, arrest and, if possible, reverse the collapse. And second, you have to reconstruct the system because it cannot be reconstructed the way it was. It can't be restored. So this is a different situation. And when people compare this with other previous uh, financial crises, they're making a mistake. Now, the interesting thing is that what you need to do in the short term is almost exactly the opposite of what needs to be done in the long term. Because the, obviously, the problem was excessive leverage. But when you have a, co a, a, co a um, collapse of credit, you then have to, uh, and there's only one source of credit that is still credible, and that's the state, the Federal Reserve, and the Treasury. And, and then you have to actually inject a lot more leverage and, cap and money effectively. You have to print money as fast as you can, expand the, the, the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve, increase the national debt. Uh, and that is in fact what, what has been done, which is the right thing to do, but then you have to, to once the, this policy is successful, you will then have to drain the money supply as fast as uh, the um, credit expands. So, uh, in the circumstances, I would say that policy generally lagged uh, behind events. We were uh, behind uh, the curve. Now that the, the, the free fall is moderating, uh, and the space of uh, 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 the collapse has more or less occurred. Uh, I think we, are, we have a good hope that policy will in fact catch up uh, with events. And I, I actually hope uh, uh, it will be very interesting what's going to happen in the next 10 days uh, with the test, stress test. Because that's basically where uh, the policy has been lagging behind uh, in uh, recapitalizing the banks. And that's where mo most of the confusion and distress uh, comes from. But if the stress stress is, is uh, really used uh, to, to give a realistic picture of the banks, I think that the good banks will be able to raise money and that will narrow the problem and then the government can deal with the recapitalization. And then we avoid the, 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 uh, the danger that we, I think we are all aware of, of uh, uh, zombie banks that are deep in the hole that are going to have to earn their way out of that hole and will continue to weigh on the economy for a very long time.
George, thank you. <clears throat> Professor Wells, we have done this in alphabetical order, in case you hadn't noticed. This is, and I I'm have sure the Robin has dealt with being a W for a long time. Yes, and I have the advantage of then following up and being able to, uh, to follow up on what others have said, so it's fine by me. Um, I don't have any particular expertise about what the economy is going to do today or six months from now. I don't have any particular expertise on how viable the green shoots are, although I will say that I'm somewhat skeptical because, as I've said to other people, the rate at which things were declining during the first quarter means that if that decline kept on, pretty soon we'd hit the Stone Age. So it had to moderate at some point. However, moderating is not the same thing as a recovery. And as Paul and others have said, I'm not really sure where a recovery is going to come from. Um, but given that, I also want to focus on a somewhat different point. I do think that for policy reasons, it's important to figure out whether there are green shoots and how viable they are. But I think that an emphasis exclusively on that leads us to the possibility of not solving some deep structural problems. What I'm really concerned about is what do we do to prevent ourselves from being in the situation 10 years from now? Say if we do have green shoots, say if we do start to have a recovery, say by this time in 2010 or maybe a little bit later, although I do think that's somewhat unrealistic, what prevents us from, if the banks have limped along and the stock market is back up, 10 years from now, having gone back into the situation of excessive leverage and having an implosion of the financial sector and these huge global repercussions? And in order to answer that question, uh, or at least examine it, I have to uh, take you through a little economics tonight and a little bit of history. I want to go back to what Paul said about the global savings glut. The global savings glut is what drove interest rates down to uh, historically low levels. And if you know much about macroeconomics, you know that housing is very sensitive to the interest rate. And therefore, a housing bubble uh, was practically foreordained with an extended period of low interest rates. All right. But you'll also notice that the bubble in housing hasn't been just in the United States. It's been in places like Spain. It's been in Eastern Europe. It's been in the UK. It's been in Ireland. It's been in Iceland. So Paul is really correct when we talk about a global savings glut, a global savings glut that, yes, impacted us very badly, but it's impacted other countries as well. So I think in order to prevent us from re-experiencing this catastrophe in another, say, 10 years, we need to look at the origins of the global savings glut. And now, yes, there are some differences in how those were actually manifest between the different countries, and those manifestations are important, but let's look for a moment at the global savings glut on a global level. All right, so if we back up, and I think this story starts really about in the 80s. Because in the 80s, during the Reagan years, we began to experience chronic fiscal deficits. And we began to abdicate our responsibility to raise tax revenue that could sustainably finance government. Now, in order to do that, we had to borrow. And who did we borrow from? We borrowed from countries that were running persistent trade surpluses. And going to Niall's uh, point, that's China, that is also Germany, and that's also Japan. And as we continue to run these deficits, these countries, by keying on growing through exports, there grew to be this symbiotic relationship, as Niall says, this chimerica, but it was on several different fronts between the net exporters, such as China, Japan, and Germany, and the net importers of capital, the largest, of course, being the United States. All right. This import of capital allowed us to consistently live beyond our means. 
First, through the fiscal deficits, not raising enough tax revenue to finance the government. And then also through, ultimately, the leverage that we used in housing and in commercial real estate and in leverage buyouts. And this continued and it grew because there was nothing anywhere along the line which anyone would say halt. I think that we had a situation in which we were governed by an administration, Republican administrations, in which it was in their interest not to call a halt to these persistent imbalances. The persistent imbalances led us to pretend that we could keep borrowing and not having sufficient tax revenue to pay for the government. And also, if your house prices are rising, if your stock market is going up, which is, of course, is going to happen if you have cheap money, it puffs up the value of the assets, then that disguises a lot of other structural problems, such as rising inequality, all right, such as corruption. So at this, we also get an increase in the financial take of the economy. As we have this inflow of capital from abroad, the financial sector in the United States grows larger and larger relative to the rest of the economy. So we have what I call a financialization, where the GDP is tilted disproportionately towards the financial sector. All right. How do we start to get out of this? Well, it's difficult. All right. We have a situation which I find that we're often, we're in many ways almost adverse to bringing up the situation that we find, the codependent situation that we find ourselves in with the net exporting countries. I thought it was quite interesting a few weeks ago when the Chinese, uh, many Chinese officials were saying that um, it was proper and it was good economically that the U.S. continue to run persistent trade imbalances with China that the renminbi did not need to be appreciated, that we should continue doing the things as we always have, and that the U.S. should um, make sure that the value of Chinese assets were not diminished by falling the dollar. Okay. Um, I thought that was very interesting because it really was a situation in which it was clear that this was not a sustainable relationship. But no one was willing to say that, and no one was willing to say that clearly in terms of the Chinese. So I think in order to get out of the situation that we're in, we're going to have to address these global imbalances. And I know it's easy for me to say that as I'm sitting here, I'm sure, in my Chinese-made silk, silk blouse. But we're going to have to start to address these chronic trade imbalances. You might very well see a shift towards more protectionism we're going to have to actually do something about raising taxes so that we can sustain government rather than depending upon borrowing abroad. I think that we're going to have to start stepping into our role, one that we abdicated, as, as true managers and guardians in the global economy, and that we're going to have to start to grow up globally and economically. Neil, why don't you respond to the comments, and then we'll have a little discussion on that. And then I'd very much like to move to the longer term that Robin was introducing and how we really organize the American economy in the future. But let's take it from here. Well, if you listened carefully to what Paul Krugman said, he actually agreed with me. <laughs> because what he said was that everything was just fine as long as the financial credibility of the United States wasn't called into question. But my point is that it will be called into question, Paul. Of course it will. Even if the administration's crazily optimistic forecasts for growth turn out to be right, yes, it's going to be a 3% growth rate next year, 4% the year after that, 4.6% the year after that. If you believe those numbers, you'll believe absolutely anything. But they are there in the administration's budget document. Even if those numbers turn out to be true, the gross federal debt will rise over the next uh, five to 10 years uh, to around 100% of gross domestic product. But since those numbers are clearly wrong, and the trend growth rate of the US will be much closer to 1% than to four, 
it seems reasonable to anticipate a much more rapid explosion of federal debt to somewhere in the region of 140 or 150 percent of gross domestic product. Now, Paul tried to reassure you that the rising savings rate would absorb easily all of this additional debt, uh, but I have to point out uh, that what he said was misleading. Even if uh, the private savings rate rebounded to its highest point in the post-war period, it would still account for no more than 5% of gross domestic product. But this year's deficit, as I said earlier, is likely to be north of 12% of gross domestic product. So, I hate to teach arithmetic to a Nobel laureate, it doesn't quite add up. The Fed has committed itself to buying $300 billion worth of treasuries this year, but clearly it will have to buy a great many more than that. Remember, 1.7 or so trillion dollars are coming onto the market. And you just assume that the credibility of the United States in the eyes of Americans, as well as foreign investors, is going to withstand this? At some point, you know, the United States does start to look like a Latin American economy, not only to people abroad, but maybe people at home. If the Fed's balance sheet explodes to up to three or four trillion dollars, who knows how big it could get? At what point do people stop believing in the United States dollar as a reserve currency, or even as a store of value for their own savings? And these are the points which it seems to me the economists who are in a majority on this panel are dodging. There's a fundamental problem here, which could be addressed if there were any commitment on the part of this administration to root and branch long-run fiscal reform, an attempt to put the United States on a sound fiscal footing but I see no sign of it at all. The idea that we, we make $100 million worth of savings or whatever ridiculous number the president came up with it the other day testifies to the fundamental unseriousness that is the problem in Washington today. Let's uh, allow Paul and others to respond. Boy. Um, oh dear. Um, <laughs> oh dear indeed. Let's talk national income accounting uh, off stage, okay? Um, you forgot about retained earnings. By definition, savings in the economy as a whole are equal to investment. The very in the fact world, in the world the economy. very the, our trade deficit is falling, not rising. The very fact that we have a depressed economy despite these deficits tells you that the supply of savings from the private sector is in fact the desired supply of savings from the private sector is in fact greater than the amount that the federal government is is borrowing. If if that were not true, we would be seeing in fact that an excess in demand, and that's not happening. I do worry, the very different things. There's, there's a question of, is there more demand? Is the, the amount of borrowing that uh, everybody collectively, businesses and the government together, greater than the amount that the, essentially the, the, the rest of the economy is willing to lend, um, which is not a problem. Because in, it, as I, to just to go back, the, the essence of this kind of recession is precisely that the amount that collectively we want to save is greater than the amount that collectively we want to invest. That is the problem. You can't get around that. There's a very different question, which is the long-run solvency, and I do worry about that. I worry um, the, the, we, the numbers. I would disagree very much with you about those numbers, but, the, but there is a fact. We, we are currently at about debt of about 60% of GDP. Um, we have in the past been as high as 100% of GDP at the end of World War II without having a crisis, but your ability to go that high does depend upon people's belief that you will behave responsibly. Um, and that is somewhat in question. Uh, it, less so, I hope, now that we've had some regime change in this country than it was in the past, uh, but it is a problem. So there are certainly limits, and that, that is one of the concerns. But I think we do need to get these things straight, because one of the things that is a problem is intellectual confusion. Unfortunately, while there are many, many real obstacles to dealing with this crisis, it is not easy to deal with. One of the really terrifying things for me has been the extent to which um, just sheer misunderstanding, the misunderstanding of, of issues that were settled 70 years ago has been crippling a lot of the policy debate, and we do need to get these things straight. Um, can I switch to the uh, longer term just for a moment? Can I come back to you on the longer term? Because uh, Nouriel sure. wants to talk about this issue right. quickly, and then I think it, uh, we'll get to that. Uh, yes, I think the debate is a bit about uh, what needs to be done in the short term versus the long term. I think the lesson of the Great Depression is pretty clear. The Great Depression started the stock market crash, and it became Great Depression by 33, 
because of four reasons. One, we didn't believe in counter-cyclical monetary policy. The money supply contracted rather than eased. Interest rates were not falling. That made the credit crunch worse. Two, nobody believed in counter-cyclical fiscal policy. The general theory of Keynes was written only in 36. Therefore, they were raising taxes and cutting spending to maintain its balanced budget. That made the recession even more severe. Three, there was this belief in creative distraction, let the banks collapse. Thousands of them collapsed. The credit crunch became even worse. And four, 75% of households that the mortgage defaulted by 33 on their mortgage, we could, they couldn't pay it. So a stock market crash became a Great Depression. Then you had currency wars, then you had trade wars, then you had protectionism, then you had capital controls, then you had default by countries, then you had raise of nasty authoritarian regimes in Germany, in Italy, in Japan, in Spain, and then we ended up in World War II, right? So those are the consequences of not taking the right policy actions. And the right policy actions mean in the short run that you do the right stimulus. Now, I agree, however, that we have to worry about the long run. If we're gonna finance this budget deficit by printing money, we may have high inflation or hyperinflation. That's what happened in Germany in the 30s and the Weimar Republic and so on. Uh, if we are having large budget deficits and increasing the public debt, we don't know whether it's gonna be five trillion or 10 trillion, whatever. Eventually, the only few ways of resolving a debt problem, either you default on it, like countries like Argentina do, we've never done it, or use the inflation tax to wipe out the real value of the debt, or you have to raise taxes and cut government spending, and given the size of the deficits, over time, that's gonna be a painful policy political choice. So we need the stimulus in the short run. We need to have the basis for a medium term fiscal sustainability and drain the liquidity. Otherwise, we're gonna have problems over the medium term. Uh, Bill, D Bill Deep. Um, you know, I, I think that if you look at the president's budget, there is, if you look at it carefully, a potential answer to the dilemma you pose. And that is, um, he's proposed $634 billion for healthcare, that won't get there. That's not gonna get there. So that means he's going to have to do something on Medicare and Medicaid, which are very large entitlements. And I could see him with the promise of covering most Americans, how many, 95, 96%, saying we can't get there, now we have to do some things on Medicare and Medicaid. And when he does those things on Medicare and Medicaid, it shows that the growth of those programs, which are driving entitlements, are is much less steep. It's easy to deal with Social Security. And then you've sent a message to the world economy that you are a responsible fiscal uh, government. And then you might get money from China, Japan, other countries, even though the Chinese now, you know, if you have uh, they used to finance 50% of our deficit, essentially. And now it's like 11%. When it goes to 1.8 trillion, it's gonna be less than uh, 11%. Foreigners are gonna have less than 11, which brings us back to Paul's point, which is we don't really need the foreigners because we have increased our savings, meaning that savings can go into treasuries and therefore finance the uh, budget deficit. But, if savings go into treasuries, those savings aren't going into investing in companies that produce jobs and growth. So it creates a dilemma, but I believe that if you took a look at the budget deficit, or the budget, you see the beginning of an answer and an awareness on the part of the administration that this is an issue that has to be addressed. Uh, George, do you think there's a, a big inflation awaiting us? at their big rise in inflation? Yes, uh, uh, look, uh, we are going to end up with a uh, big increase in the national debt. But let's face it, for 25 years, we have been consuming more than we were producing. We, the, that debt was accumulated over 25 years of, of uh, living beyond our means. What has happened, it accumulated mainly in the housing sector and, and the financial sector, and that's now being nationalized. Uh, uh, it's the, um, a little bit unfortunate that so far we have only uh, nationalized the liabilities of, of the banks and not their assets. Uh, so, uh, but of course that's sort of uh, 
kind of a trap we have fallen. Socialism, as we say. Uh, I, I didn't call, lemon socialism. Uh, the bad side belongs to the public. Uh, so, uh, so, um, and however, and so, uh, I think it's it's right that we are uh, uh, extending uh, uh, government credit to replace the collapsing credit, uh, and uh, we have uh, we are currently facing a, de a deflationary situation. When credit restarts, suddenly there will be a flip flop. Uh, where the fear of deflation will be replaced by the fear of inflation, and the pressure for interest rates to rise will be very, very strong. At that time, the Fed would be ill-advised to keep on buying long-term debt because that would push other people out from buying the debt, and they would have to monetize it all, and you would have runaway inflation. So. Therefore, the rise in interest rates is going to choke off the recovery. And so we are facing now a period of stop-go or stagflation, similar but more severe than what we faced in, 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 the, in the 80s. Um, um, so, so, 70s, sorry, sorry, I get my decades wrong. Uh, but, but... Um, Historian here. <laughs> That's why you have a historian here, George, just to Thank get the you. decades right. 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 Uh, but uh, but uh, uh, that is a favorable outcome compared to what would have, would have happened if we didn't do what we are doing. Let, let's, Jeff, Jeff can, I, can I ask a question? Because sure. it seems to me uh, that analogies are being drawn here with various different decades. Paul seems to think that the 1930s apply. Well, of course, when Keynes was writing, globalization had completely broken down, and as he said, his recipe was really intended for a closed economy, not an open economy. Paul talks in wonderfully national terms, I noticed this in your columns, Paul, that the world's one economy now, and we have to think of it as one economy for as long as globalization holds up. Now, there's, there's, it seems to me a real problem here. We're looking at the wrong place and the wrong time for remedies. Why is this not Japan? What is the difference between what we are doing now and what the Japanese did after 1989? They did practically exactly what we're doing. Zero interest rate policy and quantitative easing, a massive increase in the public debt, huge deficits in order to try to restart the economy, and of course the propping up of the banking system rather than the kind of restructuring of bank, uh, bank debts that has been proposed by Senator uh, Bradley. Uh, now, the, what's the difference? Let's let Paul answer. Yeah. I, so, I think so, he probably has an answer. Um, no, actually, uh, on the banking side, we are behaving alarmingly like the Japanese. In fact, in many ways, we, now the funny thing is that we came into this, uh, I, by the way, I think both the 1930s and Japan's lost decade are entirely relevant. That's very much the framework in which I think, and, and a lot of what I'm saying really are global issues, and I hope we have a chance to get to this, because it is, a, it is a global savings glut. The world as a whole has more desired savings than the world as a whole is willing to invest. That's our problem right now. That's the immediate problem. Um, and if I were going to say, the, the U.S., the amazing thing about U.S. policy is that we have policymakers who thought a lot about Japan, tremendous emphasis at the Fed, tremendous emphasis on learning from the Japanese lesson decision we were not going to do what the Japanese did, that we were not going to have a fiscal response that was just enough to prop up the economy, but not enough to really generate a recovery, that we were not going to let the banks slide, uh, sort of propping them up, but not actually fixing them. And then faced with the actual crisis, what we have is a fiscal response that's enough to prop up the economy, but not enough to generate a real recovery. And what we're doing is letting the banks slide, propping them up enough to keep them from collapsing, but not enough to really fix them. So the, we've actually turned Japanese in spite of an enormous determination, at least verbally, not to do that. That's what scares me about this, that we have, we, in this case, we thought we had learned from history and, and in the event have proved unable to avoid repeating it. And that is, that is a very frightening thing. So, and on that, I think we're in agreement. But I, the point about the Japanese is not that they did too, too much on either of these fronts, but they failed to do enough, which was the policy consensus. Well, 
If you asked what Larry Summers was saying before, it was you have to have a Powell doctrine. You have to hit this kind of problem with overwhelming force. And what we've instead got is a Vietnam-style escalation. Let me let uh, Nouriel make a quick comment on this, and then let's go on to uh, broader issues about the future. Yes, I mean, in some sense, I actually think we're trying to avoid the mistakes of Japan. Japan waited two years until they cut interest rates after the, the bursting of their bubble. We have done it very aggressively, done to zero, very fast. Japan went half-heartedly into quantitative easing. We've done it big time. Japan reversed the zero interest rate policy too soon. That was a mistake. Japan waited two years after the bursting of the bubble to do any fiscal stimulus. And then instead of doing infrastructure, they built marinas in every fishing village. So there was not productive investment. Japan imposed a consumption tax too early. There was a contraction of fiscal policy. Japan kept zombie banks and zombie uh, you know, corporates alive for eight years until 98. We're not doing enough, but a year into the crisis, we're doing more than Japan did. And Japan had structural rigidities like lifetime employment that we don't have. So in some sense, there are things we can learn from Japan and do more front-loaded, more aggressive, more consistent. We're doing some of those mistakes on the banks, but I think there's a difference uh, between us and Japan as well. Uh, we have uh, 15 minutes, unfortunately. Uh, Robin wants to make a comment on this, but I also want to ask you to begin to talk uh, quickly about the future and trying to correct these imba imbalances. And you said my favorite words, which makes me very unpopular, raise taxes in the future. So <laughs> let's talk a little bit about, uh, let's get into that argument and give everybody a reasonable chance to make a contribution. All right. Uh, I wanted to start off by responding to Neil's point about this being global economy. Yes, it is a global economy, but it's a dysfunctional global economy. Because in this sort of Friedmanite view of the way that the open economy, free global trade, and free global uh, capital flows would operate, you had flexible exchange rates. And the flexible exchange rates would allow a way to equilibrate these, these, these surpluses and these deficits so that they weren't persistent. What we have now is a system of complicit cheating because we have a renminbi that needs to be um, revalued upwards. We have uh, Germany that's running persistent surpluses. We have Japan that's running persistent surpluses. If we had truly flexible exchange rates, that wouldn't be occurring. What happened to the Argentinians when they got blown up was because they were pegged to the dollar. So we have to realize that we are in a dysfunctional situation unless we actually do something to correct that, we are on the road to having that happen again. Now, as I, I was saying before um, about taxes needing to go up, taxes need to go up because we have to have, first of all, a credible commitment that we are going to pay off these debts that we, we, are, we are running up. And that's really a political question more so than an economic question. I think it's also, it also, though, goes into this issue of we need to be clear and we need to uh, treat government as a something that is that's sustainable. And I think it also, having a larger government at this point, can help deal with the problem that Paul was bringing up, which is that with a global savings glut, we have a situation in which there's more savings than profitable investment opportunities. So if you're an investor, what's your expected rate of return? Minus. And that's one way of in affecting a minus rate of return is to invest in the stock market and have it all go poof. Okay, so we could be subject to these booms and busts as long as we're, and, and what it does, it gives us over the average a negative rate of return. One way of trying to get around that is by actually having the government do the investing in things that we don't, we aren't good at investing as individuals, like environmental policy, like universal health care, like better education, like better infrastructure. I'll stop. Let me, thank, thank you. Um, let me ask George, George what should the future American economy look like, and what is the role in government in that, both public investment, taxes, and re-regulation of the financial sector, or restructuring the financial sector? Well, we have to start with recognizing that the prevailing view is false, that markets actually are bubble-prone. They create bubbles. Therefore, they have to be regulated. The authorities, regulators, have to accept <coughs> responsibility for preventing asset bubbles from growing too big. So, uh, they've expressly rejected that. 
saying that if the markets don't know, how can the regulators know? And of course they can't. So they're bound to be wrong, but they get feedback from the market and then they can uh, adjust because they have not done enough or reverse because they haven't done too much. So this means <coughs> that it's not enough to regulate the money supply. You have to regulate the credit. And that means using tools that have fallen into disuse. You have uh, uh, margin requirements, minimum capital requirements, which of course you still do, but you actually have to vary them to, to counteract the prevailing mood of the market because markets do have moods and it is the job of the regulators actually. Uh, you know, it's called irrational, it was called irrational exuberance, but it should be recognized that it's, that exuberance actually is quite rational. That when you see, when I see a bubble beginning, forming, I jump on it because that's how I make money. So it's perfectly rational. What's it's going not, on right now, of course. <laughs> so it is the job of the regulators to regulate. However, uh, we should try not to go overboard towards regulation because while markets are imperfect, regulators are even more imperfect because not only are they human, but they're also bureaucratic and they're also subject to political influences. So we want to keep regulation to a minimum, but it, it has to recognize that markets are inherently unstable. Muriel. Um, on this issue of regulation, of course, we go into cycles. You know, We had the Great Depression and then we imposed many actually useful regulations, both of the financial system and of the real economy. Some of it became excessive and then a period of deregulation started actually even before Reagan and Thatcher was Jimmy Carter that started some of the deregulation of some parts of the economy and then we went to extreme in belief that a deregulated economy is best because as George said when there are market failure there has to be prudential regulation supervision of the financial system and economic activity. We started believing that self-regulation is best means no regulation. We believed in market discipline that means no discipline because there is irrational exuberance. We relied on internal risk management models, but nobody's listening to risk managers when the risk takers are making all the profits. And then we relied on rating agencies that had totally conflicts of interest being paid by those that were supposed to be rating. So the entire model of self-regulation market discipline now has collapsed. We have to go to a world in which there's going to be more prudential supervision regulation of the financial system. The other thing has happened because of this deregulation, we've gone through these boom and bust that become more frequent and more virulent. You know, the only period of time in which the US has been going fast was in the 80s with the real estate bubble, when bust, SNL crisis, 1991 recession. Then with the tech bubble, when bust, then with the 2001 recession. Then we created with easy money, easy credit, and lack of regulation, the credit, and the housing bubble. Now we have a bigger economic and financial crisis. I think the challenge for the US economy is, can we grow without excessive credit and leverage? Can we go in a more sustainable way? And what are gonna be the sectors of the economy that gives us sustainable long-term growth? I think that's an open question. Paul, you want to address this variety of issues? Oh, gosh, there, there are so many things that, that I'd like to talk about. Let, let's talk about where we ought to be when, when we come out of this, which God knows when, but when we come. Um, so f I, I, let me say, there, I think there are two, there are two big structural changes that we, we'd want to see. One is um, we need to definancialize the economy. We, we, we went from an economy in which about 4% of GDP came from the uh, financial sector uh, to an economy in which 8% of GDP comes from the financial sector and which at its peak, 41% of profits were being earned by, by the financial sector. And there is no reason to believe that anything productive happened as a result of all of that. We had uh, all of these uh, extremely highly compensated bankers who were essentially uh, just finding new ways to offload risks onto other people. And it, um, and we, we really need to shrink this back down. We, we need a, as, as I've written, we need, we need a boring banking sector again. This, all of this high finance has, has turned out to be just destructive. And that's partly a matter of regulation. It, 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 we, we, but we need to accept that, that we, we're not going to go back. And by the way, also a, a, a political economy vicious circle here because as the 
financial sector got increasingly bloated, its political clout also grew. So in fact, deregulation bred bloated finance, which bred more deregulation, which bred this, this monster that, that uh, ate the world economy. Um, the other thing, I, and this is a little bit off, but I think it's worth saying, one thing not to miss is the importance of a strong social safety net. Um, by most accounts, most projections say that the European, European Union is actually going to have a somewhat deeper recession this year than the United States. So in terms of macro management, they're actually doing a poor job, and there are various reasons for that. The European Central Bank is too conservative, Europeans have been too slow to do fiscal stimulus. But the human suffering is going to be much greater on this side of the Atlantic, because Europeans don't lose their health care when they lose their jobs. They don't find themselves with essentially no support once their trivial unemployment check has fallen off. We have got nothing underneath. When Americans lose their jobs, they fall into the abyss. That does not happen in other advanced countries. It does not happen, I might sort of want to say, in civilized countries. Um, and <laughs> there are people who say that we should not be worrying about things like universal health care and the crisis. We need to solve the crisis. But this is exactly the kind of time when the importance of having a decent social safety net is driven home to everybody, which makes it a very good time to actually move ahead on these other things. Thank you, Paul. <clears throat> Neil, the future, the role of government, and Bill, you got the first word and you're going to get the last word. Well, I tell you what, I feel depressed after what I've heard tonight. I don't know about you, ladies and gentlemen. We, we are now contemplating a massive expansion uh, of the state to substitute for the private sector because that's the only thing Paul thinks will deliver growth. We're going to re-regulate the markets. We're going to go back to those good old days. Oh, yeah, you, you applaud because you think that's a great idea. Where were you in the 1970s? <laughs> just just remind, where were you in the 1970s when all these wonderful regulations were in place? I, I don't remember that going too smoothly. But what, what, what else are we going to do? Oh, we're going to print money almost limitlessly. We'll print money. That's going to be fine, too. And then when we're done with that, we're going to raise taxes. <laughs> What a fabulous package we have in store for us. You know, back in late 2007, I was asked what my big concern was. And my, I said, my concern is that we're going to get the 1970s for fear of the 1930s. And that is exactly where the majority of people on this panel are steering this country. And it's very easy to forget in your ire and indignation at the failure of the market. It's very easy to forget where the true mainsprings of economic growth lie. Ladies and gentlemen, the lesson of economic history is very clear. Economic growth does not come from state-led infrastructure investment. It comes from technological innovation and gains in productivity. And these things come from the private sector, not from the state. If you want to try the Soviet model, fine. <laughs> By all means. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let you. If you... No. 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 No, but, but wait a second, wait a second, if you, if you want, no, let me finish. One comment. No, wait, no. No, no, Can we, no. I, I think everybody on this panel is now biting his tongue, and, and let's let Bill, well, Jeff, uh, including myself, Jeff, we but know, let's, we let, know where you let's let Bill we know where have you the final stand. word. No, 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 come on, Neil, let's let you, we we're, know where you we're doing you a good turn by not extending this 10 minutes. <laughs> Bill has the final we word, know Please, where you Bill. Jeff, Jeff, we know where you stand on big government. Um, and, I, and remember, your role is that of anchor. The, the, the critical point here is... Please, that Neil, my role of anchor is now to pass it on to Bill. I think, I think we understand your point. Very good. Bill. So, <laughs> uh, as we look at the future, one of the main things that we have to do, I agree with Paul on a social safety net, health education in particular, uh, but we also have to look at the mistakes policymakers made in the last 10 years. I mean, you know, uh, it's not news that people are greedy. That's kind of nat human nature. It is that we made conscious decisions not to put limits on that natural human impulse. What were the mistakes? In 1998, we allowed investment banks, banks, insurance companies to combine. 
We eliminated Glass-Steagall. Why was Glass-Steagall put into law? Because the last time we didn't limit greed, we got into trouble, the Great Depression. And the second mistake was in 1999, the explicit decision by an administration and a Congress not to regulate derivatives, in particular credit default swaps, that in 2002 were worth $1 trillion and today are worth $33 trillion. And that decision not to eliminate derivatives created the following sequence. You have mortgages. A, th a thousand mortgages is a mortgage-backed security. A thousand mortgage-backed securities is a collateral debt obligation. A thousand collateral debt obligations is a CDO squared. And ensuring each one of those tranches is part of that $33 trillion. And we decided not to regulate it. 384 people in the London office of AIG destroyed, <laughs> oh, no, not the, destroyed, destroyed. For AIG. I'm now to blame for AIG. No, I no, mean, no, no. Why did I accept this invitation? <laughs> no, 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 I said, I said the London office. It could have been Hamburg. 33 people, 384 people in the London office doing the derivatives destroyed a company that had 116,000 employees in 120 countries. Why? Because there was no regulation at all. Third decision, 2004. The SEC allowed banks to go from 10 to 1 leverage to 30 to 1 leverage. And guess what? Once they were allowed to do it, they did it. And so if we're going to look at the future, we might think of undoing those three mistakes. And we might want to remember that the chairman of the Federal Reserve is supposed to remove the punch from the party when it gets out of control. And that did not happen in the Greenspan years. The opposite happened. Thank you, Bill. Very Just a brief point on Neil's point on socialism. The previous administration was so ideologically free market, laissez-faire, wild west capitalism, and they didn't believe in any prudential regulation supervision that they created such a big financial and economic disaster that they turned out to be the socialists because they were the ones that implemented all these policies that were now government intervention. If we had been more pragmatic, less ideological, and believing government can provide the safety net, government can provide prudential regulation supervision, we would not have this mess and we'll have an economy that functions as a market economy where the government will have its own role. That was the problem. Nuriel, thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank uh, uh, Neil Ferguson for being a brave soul up here. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the editor and publisher of my favorite publication, the New York Review of Books, and uh, Penn World Voices. Thank you all for being a very good audience. Thank everybody on the panel. We appreciate it.